Blech. You know, when I heard the news about Manny, uh, it was kind of rough. He was a very old friend of mine. I'd known him since probably before high school. I mean, you had just worked with him so recently. It must have been a shock that for this to just happen out of nowhere. You know, there was a lot of rumors out. You know, people said it was true, but I liked it. You know, a little bit concrete, concrete proof is always good. I really wanted to believe that it wasn't true and that he was just... MIA from Facebook or, you know, social media because he, he was terrible with phones. <laughs> you know, so he would go miss it for a couple of days and be like, Oh, you know, but then he'd always come back. He would come to all the shows, right? Jersey and PA, like those local kind of shows. Man, he was always there. And uh, we always had a lot of fun. He was a character. I mean, you know, he, he was all right. You know, he was a character. He was always goofing around, you know, but he was, it was all good. You know, he would always come in, sit behind my kit, you know, like play my kit a little bit and you know, bullshit, you know, have lunch, right? We would, you know, we would all have a big lunch together. He would usually show up for sound check and then stay for the show as well. And so we would spend the whole day together. He, he's one of my people from back in the day when we all grew up and you never want to hear that about anybody, especially like your peers, your old friends. I was just hoping that it just wasn't true that he had passed. I heard from too many people within the circles that he had passed, and I was I was very upset because he was a very he was a good guy. Again, I wasn't as close to him the last few years as maybe I should have been, but uh, you know I did speak to him now and then, and and you know on on uh, on Facebook, whatever. The only good thing about Facebook, you know, is that like you can you know reach out to people that you don't see a lot, and, and they could reach out to you just on a personal level and just say, hey, what's up? It's a shame when, I mean, he was 69. That's not today's standard. That's not old. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's sad. I'm sad. Sad to see him go. I was always happy to see him and, I, and he was always really gracious to me. The reverence, you know, that, that Jerry had for him was uh, always stood with me, you know, and everybody that, everybody that knew him, right, that was there, you know, 20 years before, you know, I was in the picture, you know. Life is life. It sucks. You got to live for today. You got to live for today. That is most certainly true. What was Manny's dynamic in the group with you guys? Was it like, you know, was he kind of like the jokester? Was he... A lot of calamity. He was a very he was a fucking funny guy. He was a prankster. Oh, he was a prankster. Calamity, you know, whatever. It was before a show. I didn't know who... I didn't, I didn't know who Manny was. He was in the RV... And I would typically get ready, you know, in the venue. But when I got back on the bus, I walked in and he was making me, you know, he was a, a ball buster, right? All those guys from that era, you know, he had a couple couple of drinks in him, right? So he was f feel, feeling kind of randy with me. And, um, you know, I was kind of taken aback by this guy that was really busting my balls. The guy that he was with was, was a real straight guy and was like apologizing for him. And I was just like, I don't get it. You know, who... who who is this guy? Why is this guy telling me like what you know what I could do and uh, and acting like you know like he like he knows me and joking around with me like this? Anything, for, anything for a laugh. And then finally, I think our tour manager King Tut he came in and he and he well and he oh man he's so good to see you you know and then he told me who who man he was. Of course, I'm a drummer. You know, he's a drummer. So our relationship started like that, and he was always you know really cool to me. I get it. I'm new and I don't know anybody, and you know you've been here a long time, and you know what? I'm going to give you your your props. You know, you can bust my chops all you want. The vibe that I got from when I spoke to Manny was that uh, he. Was was kind of like uh he was a bit of a scrapper back then did he have do you remember him being kind of like a tough yeah oh yeah yeah manny manny was tough when we were young yeah definitely oh, wait, oh this is a good wait 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 so this is what he told me all right so now this is a misfit story this is a good one yeah i definitely wouldn't have messed with him <laughs> <laughs> At the Eddie's Lounge show with Frank's first, uh, which was Frank's first show, they did two sets. They did one uh, earlier in the night where it was half keyboard, half guitar. And again, so during the second set, there was a drunk guy, which you could hear. He showed me the tape. You could hear him yelling, fuck you. And uh, eventually the guy threw a cigarette at 
Manny's kick drum with which had a I believe it was like a pillow or a shirt in it to kind of dampen it and it caught fire so you hear him yell on the tape Bill Kanj and I guess he came and he put it out or whatever he got it out of there well Manny said at the end of the night <laughs> he goes to take a piss in the bathroom who's taking a piss the guy who threw the cigarette before the guy could even turn around he said he knocked him in the back of the head and beat the shit out of him. <laughs> Hey, you mess with a man drumming, you're gonna get punched. Like, like uh, one of those guys. He maybe he won't start a fight, but he'll definitely finish it. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that's true. Yeah, yeah, he was. Uh, I mean, but a good guy. But yeah, he, you know, don't mess with him. You know, attitude. You got some fucking attitude. Don't mess with Manny. Yeah. Don't 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 ever mess with Manny. Oh, he said, "Don't throw a cigarette at my fucking kick drum." <laughs> Yeah, I actually, I actually went out with him and Robbie, like, I think in April or March or May, we just went to get something to eat. Yeah, they were up, he was up here, so I hadn't seen Manny in a long time. What was that like, seeing him after all that time? I believe I believe Robbie called me and said, I got somebody here, and it was Manny, and they were the next town over, and so I met him at a diner. What was it like recording with him, though? So what was very interesting about jamming with him and trying to, to capture his drums was, hey. He didn't realize this while he did it, and he did it back in his time with the Misfits. He would hum while he's playing. It was a different type of a drummer. You would hear him actually bleed through the overhead mics, humming the song. And I'm like, you can't do it. We're gonna, you're going to be able to hear that in the recording. You know, don't hum it. But um, he's like, and I would play it back for him. He'd say, really? That, that was me? Yeah, yeah. I think it was a timing thing. I think he was like just trying to memorize what he was doing, and he would sound it out. It was really interesting. I never seen a drummer do that. We had a nice conversation, you know, but they he had to get Manny back, you know, so it was it was good. I hadn't seen him in many years. That's a long drive. It's like two and a half hours. Yeah, there was a point in Manny's life, like I said, when he had those demons within him, I would try and reach out to him. He didn't even know who I was. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, listen, life is complicated. Yeah. Yep. You know. So it was kind of like his own unique way of drumming yeah it was very strange and um what was also hard to capture well it wasn't hard it was just i i'm personally not used to uh i haven't worked with any drummers like this was he played open-handed meaning i believe he was a lefty yeah i don't believe he crossed either i'm trying to remember that's that's a tough one but his style was unique he played as if he was a righty. So he would sit there, I'm trying to look for drumsticks, and he would follow. So normally you would drum like this. He would drum like this with his left hand on the hi-hat and his right hand hitting the snare like this. It's so unnatural for me. Most people have not really had a chance to hear like the full breadth of what Manny's capabilities were as a drummer, he was, from what I heard, he was an incredible, incredible drummer. How would you describe his style as a drummer? Well, I, I Manny had a, a more of a jazz background than, than uh, well, definitely than I did. So it, there was a lot of jazz in his playing. Uh, you know, the stuff that, you know, the stuff that was going on at the time when we were all playing, I don't, I don't think, uh, play to his strengths, if that's if that's a good way to put it. He he would probably sounded great in a jazz band. He he went out he went out of the pocket a bit. I think he did his own little thing there to kind of jazz it up. Real real loose, you know. Real he plays it real loose. It's got a um, it's got a, a tightness about it, and it's got a looseness about it. You know, it's it's great. Like you know. People that can be creative, you know, there's so many people that I've, I've met in my life that they may not be technically the best musicians in the world, you know, but like to be creative is such a special gift, you know. You know, unfortunately, he only played really on those two songs. So you don't know what would have led to had he played on the others, you know. I mean, that's that was Ringo's style. You, you were talking about uh, about Ringo, right? The, the way that Ringo played. And I just recently heard a thing. I mean, you know, like, you know, who Greg Bissonette is he's a drummer that plays with Ringo's band now. Ringo. No, Ringo would have been open handed if he had followed his instinct of playing lefty on a righty kit. And he was playing. Uh, what's this a Beatles song? 
but he was playing just jamming out to and he and Ringo came out and said oh you know you, you almost played that song right you know and he's just like well what, what do you mean and, and it's because Ringo um you know played his tom with his left hand instead of crossing it over you know there was something that he did but he was like he would like his roles Ringo's would go like left to right which makes sense as a lefty and it does kind of change the feel of it a little bit, you know? And he's just like, well, now I, I do it the way Ringo played it. But Manny, he'd have an extra floor tom right next to the hi-hat, which is another, I've never recorded that. So like when he was hitting the floor, he'd be leading with his left hand like this, hitting the snare, which is very strange for norm, you know, conventional righty drummers. It was, it was very interesting. That's really interesting that you say that, that play to his strengths, like, in the sense that like the 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 genre of music that you guys were all playing was more rock oriented and what his strengths leaned less rock oriented yeah I, you know i think so just from from listening to a lot of his playing i can hear a lot of jazz stuff um which, which is i mean it's difficult to play so he mastered that pretty well how does that translate sonically to the style of playing Oh, it makes it so much jazzier, so much, because he would constantly, he would switch off from the hi-hat to, I believe he used almost a ride instead of a crash right next to his hi-hat, which is not traditional. Usually you'd have a ride on your right side. So he would go like this with his left hand, switching from the hi-hat to the ride constantly, just bam, 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 bam. It was very strange, but that's what made it so jazzy. Like, what makes that difficult to play, exactly? Well, I mean, I mean it's, it's very different timing, Jax. You have to uh, study it. <laughs> it's not like rock and roll where it just kind of comes natural. Um, it, it, it's a lot more work to be a good jazz drummer, I think, than to be a good rock drummer. And, and, and he had it nailed. You just didn't get to hear it as much as you should have. And that's also why... If you're a righty drummer, playing Cough Cool, that intro, is so strange. I don't know what's going on in the drums on Cough Cool, right? It's it's such a, you know, I don't know where the, where the, where the, where the one starts. And, you know, it's just like a, a really difficult, unless you say, listen, I'm going to play this song the way I'm going to play it. You know, we have to play it with, you know, with it's, we got to count this out, you know. Well, like the original version of it is, it's 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 so difficult to, to match it, you know, because you have to do this. He would have to do this, which makes so much more sense, um, coordination wise. You don't have to cross your arms and go around the kit. He would literally just keep his one hand there all the time and just go bop 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 bop. Yeah.
chaos, you know, it's, <laughs> it's chaos. And it's, it's, it's so much better than I would have. It's better than I thought. It's much better than I thought. Um, it, it's wow, mi- awesome it's mind boggling, man. It's mind boggling. When you're doing rock drumming as opposed to maybe jazz drumming is like the feel and the swing is different. It's not, it's not the same. Yeah. It's very, it's very different. Well, for me anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, rock drumming comes very natural. Jazz drumming, you know, has to be studied for me. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because Ringo, a left-handed guy playing a right-handed kit, that led to certain little delays when he would hit the drum, mm-hmm. right? And that informed the sound that nobody can, you know, it's like, it's like if you don't, the it's the, in the little details the human, not the human errors, but like the humanity, the human swing, right? Like the, the, that element that makes somebody's particular way of playing hard to replicate, or th- that little element is what makes a song sound more authentic when it is reproduced than if you're just playing it straight, mm-hmm. you know, absolutely. right? Am I absolutely. right? Yeah, Absolutely. It's all, it's all those little idiosyncrasies that make it sound the way it does, you know? When you took over for Manny in the band and you started to adapt your drumming style to what he was doing, how did that, how did that shift happen? Because his parts were kind of, they were pretty like intricate and unique. Do you remember? Was it was it a was it a big to do with the changeover from Manny to to Jim? Was what no. was the transition like? I don't. Nah, I, it was pretty. It was pretty flawless. It was pretty quick. It was nothing because we just started doing the Static Age stuff and you know um, and all those songs and that's what we were kind of playing. So it was you know it, it was pretty it was pretty flawless. No big deal at all. Did he show you anything? Like, tell me about that. No, no, he he didn't show me anything. Uh, I just kind of did, you know, what I was going to do, and, and and you know, the band went from a, a piano bass and drums to a guitar bass and drums, so the whole feel became different. Jim made things faster, you know, with his playing style. Do you think would would Manny have been able to have played that fast? Yeah, they were two different types. They were two different type of drummers. You know what I mean? But Manny was a good drummer. Uh, you know, just different different style, different technique. I mean, it, it, he would have did it just fine. Uh, the best example might be uh, the only song we both recorded was She. I know he recorded it and I recorded it, and you can hear how different it is. Killing it. Wow, it's murdering you. And that's from the from the single version, right? That's from the B side. Those, uh, those are the cough cool versions of those songs. Versions. Those are not. Those are not the. Uh, that's not from Static Age. That's not Mr. Jim's version. Yeah. Oh, for sure. For yeah. sure. That's actually really interesting. That's a really interesting song to compare and contrast. Actually, the. Um, I mean, your version of "She" on Static Age is like. It's it's driving. It's really like yeah. it's more straight ahead. Manny's is more intricate. Best way to put it.
there's more stuff going on when Manny's playing it than when I'm playing it. Manny's doing more stuff in the song. You know, that like, ramones kind of hi-hat, you know, like, you know, just those 16th notes on it, the merciless, you know, uh, very driving, awesome. Man. You know, wow, I'm glad that you played that, you know. Hopefully it makes sense what I'm trying to convey with, like, the hand gestures, because it really is, like, when you see it visually, you could tell it's not just a traditional drums style. You know, the open-handed style is so unique. The only other punk drummer that I know that did it was the original drummer for Green Day. If you look up Green Day in like 1988, 89, they were performing at a high school. And that's sort of how Manny drummed, where he would have the hi-hat like this. And it's so strange. When I'm listening to She in general, my ear always gravitates towards the drum fills. Right. And there's dr there's fills, there's plenty of fills on both versions, both drum parts that you yeah. guys both do. So I think maybe that's where like it's very easy to like sort of blink your eyes and not sit back and go like, wait a minute, like there's there's yeah. some differences here. Yeah, yeah, I mean, fills are very different from his and mine. Uh, you know, different timings. Uh, he would come in at a different time than me, and and he didn't have, I mean, he didn't have a guitar to rely on either, and I did. So that's interesting. Wow, whoa, whoa, whoa! That's a very interesting thing to take note of too. So you, so you're playing to the guitar, and he's not playing it to a guitar, like in terms of like you know the, what you're hearing by ear. Right. He was playing to the piano and, and the bass. Hmm. Right, Fred, and, there's no guitar on, on, on his recording of that. Right, and you I have Frank's, Frank's guitar, yeah, yeah. You have Frank's guitar. That was a weird band, though, too. Like, the idea of them playing with no yep. guitar, just, yeah. the, you know. It was different. That is really, really interesting. What did it most remind you of, if you, in, in, in your personal opinion? What would it most? Oh, I, I never gave that any thought. It was unique. We've both heard those early misfits recordings right Correct. we both listened to them what i find interesting and maybe you could put into better words than than i is the way that manny interacts with jerry as a bass player and glenn as a vocalist through his drumming it's almost like it's manny and and jerry have to have to work twice as hard to back up glenn's vocal you know yeah yeah to the point. What do they say? The the drummer is the conductor of the band. Is the conductor. So he's kind of conducting them in this material. And it's really sort of interesting because he's not is Manny in the pocket? Manny kind of marched to the beat of his own drum with drumming because he didn't do traditional beats. And it's so weird too, because that band was a very different band than your the band that you were in. You know, I, I'm, I don't like to compare. You know, they did their own thing. I wonder what, yeah. it, what it would have been like if he would have, you know, if he would have continued with the band and, you know, how they would have sounded. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was It was more, uh, had it stayed that way, it would, be, it would have been a lot more like art rock type stuff. It showed how individualistic that band was as a three-piece jazz punk band because there was nothing like it at all. I mean, he's playing three, four in one in his favorite song, Marble Index. Marble Index. Okay. Why? Why is that? Anything in well, particular? It, it, it had like a a jazzy type of, of beat. He's playing a three, four in the beginning, which then breaks into a traditional. It was just a good song. I don't know. And it's still not traditional. It's it's it it's indescribable the way that he fit into that three piece. The, the lyrics were, uh, inside your head, there's a marble index, marbles to make up your mind. Inside your head, there's a bottle of Windex, polish your marbles to shine. And then it just went on. Yeah. And so, like, you know, Jerry is a new bass player. 
his ability for someone who's only been playing bass for a few months is is quite impeccable. We were playing in Glenn's garage, uh, basement, right, and then we went to uh, my house and we played at my house. Fantastic! When he was playing as a three piece, what my conclusion is was. I think Jerry was trying to almost compensate because they ha didn't have a guitar. They had just a keyboardist. And uh, so he was trying to sh give that pizzazz that would have been missing had it been just straight bass lines. I passed one day and I looked in his car and uh, I saw a bass guitar. And I knew that Glenn and I were talking about we need a bass player. He's he's not sticking in the low end. He's climbing, right? He's climbing and descending in various different ways, and he's filling in the gaps and adding texture. Which is very impressive for a new bass player. I mean, he was playing all the scales correctly, you know, flavorfully. It was very good, very tasteful. Do you think that, and I mean, obviously, we wouldn't really know unless we had a time machine. Do you think that Manny, like in that in those live scenarios, is Manny, like, how is Manny influencing? Is he influencing? Is he sort of uh, informing Jer uh, things for Jerry in some way? Like, he has to be a some sort of support structure for Jerry to even be doing that stuff. Am I correct on that? Absolutely. Drummers and bass players have to be a sonic volcano where they're intertwined with one another because that's the force of the band. Bass without a good bassist and a good drummer that are in sync, you have nothing. There's no foundation, there's no rhythm. How the sound was was how it came out. You know, how it came out was how it was, you know? Probably could have been pretty interesting. I wish next to the static age sessions there was like a full 17, 18 song, you know, session oh, of cough cool. I would have loved to hear I mean I know they did a lot of the songs from Static Age back then, and I, I never heard their versions of them. I would love to hear them, but I guess they're not around. You know, unfortunately, he only played really on those two songs, so you don't know what would have led to had he played on the others, you know? Your contribution to the band was doing Cough Cool. Yeah, Cough Cool, She. There was a lot of other songs. Okay, but that, that was had. the big one? Yeah. Well, that was the first uh, 45. Okay. A lot of songs that the Misfits did after that. They were songs that I did with them. Oh, okay. I mentioned Jerry before, but also when I was saying about Manny, you know, Manny, as you said, Manny playing unconventionally, Manny's kind of conducting things sonically as you hear when you hear that stuff. Um, how does Glenn fit into that? Is Manny, like there are some drummers that almost play to the vocal, like Keith Moon. Keith Moon is a drummer. A musical drummer. Yeah, and he doesn't always it's not always about just holding the rhythm. It's like he's 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 sort of he's using his drums in a different way. I got that similar sort of sense from Manny with Glenn. What is your take on it? Oh, he played he was playing a uh, a piano, a electric piano and stuff like that and uh, right. and drums. That was it. I think that at that period in time, the way Glenn was writing on the Fender Roads it was perfect for that jazzy drum style. It would have never worked with a drummer like Googie, who was a fantastic meat and potatoes punk rock drummer. Meat and potatoes, but he does it so good. And the same, you know, Robo with the thrashier stuff. It could have never worked with any other Misfits drummer the way Glenn's mindset was at that time with the Fender Rhodes. It just wouldn't have worked. Because, and you know why that is? Because his Fender Rhodes playing, it's very different. It's very, very different. Uh, it, I mean, it's just weird because it's just, again, you know, you think that you would think that maybe the the piano, the having a piano versus a guitar definitely changes things. But at the same time, the band is still playing kind of ferociously. So it doesn't, you know, something I always wondered and, you know, uh, I, I don't know if you know the, you probably don't know the answer to this, but it's just something I'm going to wonder out loud anyway. So why, I wonder why Glenn chose to play the piano instead of just play the guitar, you know, because it sounds like he's trying to do rhythm guitar playing with the piano. I, have no, I couldn't answer that question. <laughs> you know, it's, it's as different as it is. It's also the same. I don't know. It's, I have no idea, but I, I know what you're talking about, but yeah, I get it. 
right? Like he's like kind of doing a, yeah. I don't know. He's, it's like he's doing like rhythm guitar. Now he's strumming on the piano. It seems from my ear that when he's playing that piano, it's very rudimentary. He's just going dun, 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 dun. You know what I mean? It's not, there's not a lot of. It, it, it almost is reminiscent of a rhythm guitar, which is probably what he was trying to do on a, in a sense. You know, from what I've listened to, he does do some, not flashy, but tasteful stuff. It's not bare bones. You could tell what's really just rhythmic, but he does add some flavor to it. You know, and it's it, you could tell it's that uh that Doorsy influence. You know, the Raymond Zarek kind of totally Doors, like like soaking as I said all those years ago, soaking in Doors. I mean, just Doors, Doors, Doors. But not emulating the doors, just no, that vibe. Trying to create incredibly original, quirky music through a filter that would be the doors, but not literally doing the doors. I mean, there was no guitar. It's almost like maybe he felt more comfortable with the piano than he did trying to do that same thing with the guitar live and that it made more sense for him at the time. And it's like, oh, okay. I'm ditching the piano. Well, let's bring in an actual guitar player and then I'll just focus on on the main thing. Like, what is the main thing of all Misfits music is the voice. Absolutely. Well, it, it, it's the same same attitude, <laughs> I guess. But <laughs> When you hear something like that or you try to play it, you're like, wow, I, I thought I could play that, but I have to really think about it because... It's it's not conventional. And uh, Cough Cool, I would say, would be a great example of something like that. And so, which brings me to my next point in, in Manny, how Manny connects as a drummer to what is going on. How is he playing to the voice, in your opinion? It follows the vocals instead of like a nice, clean count into the parts, you know? And then a guy like me that's just like, well, you know, I... I you know, we had, to, we had to really work on it. I think he kind of danced around the voice. That's the only way that I could see, that, you know, I could make sense of it is if you were really paying attention to what Glenn was doing, you know. What I mean by that is I remember really specifically listening to Hollywood Babylon and Jim plays it pretty straightforward, you know, with some spice on the hi-hat. But Manny was doing almost like a, a shuffly disco-ish beat where it's... And it was really like he was dancing around Glenn's vocal and it gave it such a different vibe. That's how I tried to, to break it down for myself, right? I pay attention to the vocals. Don't think so much about that. Like this part should be longer, technically should be longer and it shouldn't go, you know, forget about that. Just follow the vocals, you know. Um, I think Manny was really good at that. Every song that I've heard him do that was later done with the Static Age lineup, he was doing intricate little fills and kind of offbeat sort of rhythms. It's really just a different drummer's approach to the same song that, you know, that jazzy Buddy Rich style. And it's it made the songs really unique for what they were doing. What is his legacy to the Misfits, in your opinion? What do you think? Right, without Manny, Glenn would have never met Jerry, right? Well, maybe, maybe eventually, but not at the time. My neighbor, she, uh, her name was Patricia. She had a, a boyfriend, and that was Jerry. We were hanging out, and they were practicing or something like that, and Manny would come over, and whatever, they got to talking, and Jerry wound up being over there, yeah, and then next playing the bass. I mean, you had been playing, you had been playing with Glenn prior to that, after your other band that you guys did, but you guys have been kind of jamming around anyway, but you didn't know who Jerry was, right? No, no, I had never met Jerry or Frank until, uh, I, you know, Glenn gave me a call and said, you want to jam, try this out, you know. Glenn was going to do what he was going to do because he had the vision and he had the songs. I went along with Glenn because uh, I knew he had talent. Okay. And uh, then we started The Misfits. It goes beyond musically, right? He, he did have the foresight to kind of introduce and help, you know, combust that, you know? 
But Jerry was a major component to that original lineup, major component. And Manny, if he wasn't living where he was living, where Jerry had his girlfriend at the time, they, w- they wouldn't have had him. In the grand scheme of things, because his tenure was kind of short, lived in the band historically, uh, it's easy to not, you know, give him as much credit as I think he really deserves, you know. They could have had some other guy that could have totally changed everything. I mean, it's, it's, he's a key player in that whole situation. So Manny is, should be synonymous with how the formation of the Misfits came to be, you know, just as much as the other two. A lot of things wouldn't have happened if, if, if everybody didn't play their role the way that they did at the very beginning and the middle and the end and currently, right? It's all really important. He was almost like an incubator for them and their relationship. And then they would go on and, and, and evolve into what they became. But he was like, absolutely in, in this history of this band that we love, he has this really sort of important role. And I, I don't think any of us will ever forget him for it. We really appreciate it. I hope that Manny's legacy lives on within the Misfits community because I hope people do appreciate. I mean, I know we love the, the little details and all the crazy fanatical fan bullshit. You know, like anybody else, you know, sorry to see him go. I'm glad he had the time that he did, you know, you know here with us. So now we're here to, uh, you know, give a little salute to Manny. Salute to Manny. And I was glad to have the time that I did with him. You know, the best I could say is, you know, rest in peace. And, uh, you know, it's it's a tough one. His legacy is most certainly secured and lives on in the music that he helped to create, that you both helped to create. So, you know. Always, always be there. Yeah. That's true. That That is true. Theme for a Manny. That's what we're going to call this episode. Theme for a Manny. <laughs> I, I love it. <laughs>